what we're addressing is the question of where does the morphology come from, network morphogenesis. Uh, and network morphogenesis is defined as the social process wherein an embryonic network cluster develops into a differentiated and integrated uh, network morphology. And there's a great deal of interest in morphogenesis in biology. Geneticists have studied that within the confined space, you can have uh, stem cells self-organize into complex integrated morphological structures. Uh, so there's a great deal of scientific interest in it. Uh, and in our case, we're studying uh, the emergence of a major knowledge economy uh, in New York City. Uh, and the scope condition is, again, the confined ecological space. And so you can see here uh, that you have a confined ecological space insofar as in Manhattan is a narrow, small island. And the tech firms are concentrated uh, in the Midtown and Lower Manhattan area. And beginning, again, with just a few tech firms at the turn of the century, it quickly uh, evolves into a major uh, knowledge economy, regional knowledge economy, now the second largest in the United States, growing at a more rapid rate than Silicon Valley. And most people don't know about it because it is self-organized uh, and not organized from above. Uh, and the importance of the scope condition of confined ecological space is that there's ample opportunity for serendipitous chance face-to-face -face interaction. So people are uh, in Manhattan, you can rush from one part of the island to the other, but especially if you're concentrated in one re locality, it's easy to meet people. It's easy to uh, keep people in mind because they're part of your neighborhood. Uh, and so that's the parallel uh, uh, circumstance where uh, gen geneticists or biologists have been studying the self-organized growth of complex structures from stem cells. Okay, so there was a very, very rapid growth and emergence of the tech economy in New York City, beginning around 2004, uh, after the rise and collapse of the dot-com bubble, nothing was left except for a few surviving technologists and entrepreneurs. And one of the entrepreneurs, Scott Heiferman, uh, who had gone up and come down but still survived, was working at a McDonald's uh, hamburger stand in Manhattan. And he realized uh, that what was the problem with uh, New York City's tech economy, different from Silicon Valley, was that there was no infrastructure, no community, uh, and no set of institutions that could gather the uh, survivors together again. So he started the New York Tech Meetup in 2004 in this office, about five or six technologists and hackers. And it, you can see it grows slowly in the first years of 2005 to a group of about 200. And they, they, they are generalist hackers and uh, surviving entrepreneurs. But then it begins to could grow, and these are monthly membership, people who are joining the New York Tech Meetup every month. And you can see there's a beginning of an explosive growth, uh, starting paradoxically at the high point of the Great Economic Recession. Uh, and the reason for this is that there were quite a few people who lost their jobs in financial services. They were too young to retire, and they had some money in their pockets, to, and so they this, some of them started tech firms. And also, the college students, the MBA students, the lawyers couldn't find jobs in the sectors that traditionally were so lucrative in consulting financial services. And they heard about the success of some of the pioneering tech uh, entrepreneurs who were working for 100 million, 200 million. This seemed a lot better than working for a bankrupt investment banker. Uh, banker. So it grows quickly and it becomes virtually a social movement. Uh, I, there are 30,000 aspiring 
technologists, who uh, entrepreneurs who want to start up a firm currently this year in New York City. So it's, it's become what wasn't fashionable at start, a very fashionable thing to do. Um, and so the question that is lurking in the background, going back to Durkheim, is the question, does the morphogenesis of a social system follow a similar pattern as in a biotic world, where a small amount of complexity can be the source of a complex differentiated morphology? And that's the question that is looking there. And you can see this is pursued by biologists, uh, and especially the Warm Flesh et al. article shows that in the spatial confinement, uh, embryonic cell stem cells can self-organize into a complex structure. So this is a very hot area of research in biology at the time. So the question is, does this happen with social systems? Was Durkheim right to sense that he could borrow the idea from biology? Uh, well, there are three mechanisms that we argue drives the emergence of uh, network morphology. The first mechanism is network rewiring. And that is to say, rewiring of our networks takes place all the time. It happens more rapidly during periods of rapid change and gradually, slowly during stable equilibrium. But it's always the case that people are rewiring their networks, which is to update, to include new ties, people you've just met, uh, and also to deciding to maintain actively existing ties and then to ignore some or break up with others. So this is a constant process of rewiring. Uh, and rewiring actually rewards pro-social behavior. And that is the, those who are helpful to you, those who are valuable, get incorporated into the network uh, and more centrally located in the network. Okay, the second mechanism is knowledge spillover. It was discovered by one of the founders of modern economics, Alfred Marshall, who was curious about how could Great Britain's wonderful manufacturing centers at the center, end, towards the end of the 19th century maintain comparative advantage? What's the source of comparative advantage? And he, had, he came up with the theory of agglomeration and he identified three causal mechanisms. Uh, two of them, uh, non-marketable inputs. The second, uh, human capital, lots of skilled craftsmen pulled into the industrial district, were measurable. Uh, you could easily measure them. And that's why economists ran with those first two mechanisms. And Krugman took, extended Marshall's idea to the new economic geography and won a Nobel Prize from it. But he said, you know, the, the most interesting one is knowledge spillover, and we can't measure it, so I'm going to ignore it and give it to the sociologists to play with. <laughs> I think he's right. It was really interesting. And you can see the way that Marshall defined it. Mysteries of trade become no mysteries, but are, as it were, in the air. How can you measure it? It's tacit knowledge. If one man starts a new idea, it is taken by others and combined with suggestions of their own, and thus it becomes a source of further new ideas. Uh, so this is the key to the idea of innovation coming through uh, interactions, social interactions, and combining ideas that are existing and creating a new combination. And the third mechanism is the, what we call shared identity and group-mindedness. So we see a lot of this in social movements. Uh, we see a good deal of this in uh, ethnic groups that have strong boundaries. Uh, and this is, uh, leads to the expectation, rational expectation of pro-social behavior and cooperation. So think of a rising tide lifts all boat, uh, people with shared identity and group mindedness as entrepreneurs in the, or technologists in the New York uh, tech economy would like to help uh, without expectation of direct reciprocity or indirect reciprocity through, but just so that a promising new startup can succeed and that would bring collective benefits to the uh, New York City economy. So that's the idea of shared identity and group mindedness. I'm not going to focus so much on this, uh, but the two first two mechanisms, 
knowledge spillover and network rewiring. And here's a schematic account of this, how from an undifferentiated uh, blastocyst-shaped uh, network of the early founders of New York Tech Meetup, uh, it evolves into a complex uh, uh, structure uh, sh sh where you have a division of knowledge, and that's the other part that we're studying, uh, emerge uh, through the interaction between knowledge spillover and rewiring of networks. And that there, this dynamic process then leads to increasingly modular no and distinct knowledge community of specialists who have specialist know-how, specialist knowledge, and, uh, and they then, and you can see that this is the process by which the, 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 the mechanisms give rise to the fully differentiated more uh, structure. And the data for this is taking API membership overlap data from the New York Tech Meetup. Uh, and it grew from a small organization of uh, a couple dozen to about 50,000 members uh, within the period of the study, 2004 to 2015. Uh, and then the second confirmative part of it uh, is based on archive public email interactions on the New York Tech Meetup list host. And that uh, I'll refer to briefly, but it is a second analysis to confirm the main analysis based on face-to-face -face interaction, uh, showing and confirming the emergence of a morph structural morphology uh, of the division of knowledge from a very simple, undifferentiated, uh, embryonic network. And here you see it. Uh, it is possible we have the data uh, of all the members when they join and all the uh, special small meetups that they are uh, attending. And when they RSVP every year, uh, every day, there are 800 of them every week the small meetups, but we, that's just too much data. And so what we simply did was to show the emergence on an annual basis. And you can see 2005, it's this undifferentiated group of generalists. And they mainly meet the turquoise colors, the uh, time that uh, social events, and they mainly event, meet to get together and network and meet each other and talk shop. Uh, but as the process continues, you see the different colors, the orange, the yellow, beginning to become more prominent. And those are the know-how, technical know-how, knowledge uh, clusters of, uh, and division. And so you see an emerging division of labor in these structures here. And it begins to take a more pronounced form in 2011, where you can see the social part breaking away and the uh, specialized division of the knowledge parts concentrating and growing and dis differentiated. And by 2013, 2015, you see a more developed uh, network morphology with the breaking away of the social part, uh, 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 entrepreneurs getting together for breakfast, uh, cocktail hours, uh, mixers, and so forth, where people do sh talk shop and exchange their ideas. But there is now a much more distinctive division of knowledge that has emerged from this very simple earlier structure. Uh, and, and here is a more uh, precise, uh, you can see it more clearly, uh, of the different uh, modular communities. Uh, and the social part in the, breaks off, the application of technology part, the data programming part, and then the different technologist meetups. And these are smaller meetups. All of them are members of the New York Tech Meetup, but they can, the smaller meetups that are in their area of specialization or expertise. Um, but the networks are linked. There is specialization, but it doesn't fragment into specialized communities, but they're linked through overlapping membership. Uh, and so there's communication through the host system. So 
let your imagination uh, loose a bit. And you can see this image, if you imagine it as a, uh, I think of what, does it, what type of creature does it look like? Uh, because here you have something that looks like a head here, uh, something that looks not like a horn, but an antenna, right? Because you know, this is really connected by a uh, uh, long uh, net network. Uh, the neck is tied by uh, links between the social groups and entrepreneurs in, uh, entrepreneurs in New York City. And then here you have the uh, knowledge communities uh, with uh, you know, functional parts. Because remember, Durkheim was a functionalist. And here you see a division of knowledge where there are parts of the tech economy, uh, key parts, uh, programmers and uh, and uh, entrepreneurs in different sectors and different uh, industrial sectors who are meeting face to face uh, in specialized meetups uh, in their knowledge community and talking to each other. But you have generalists who are linking these different parts together. I think this is the first time that someone has documented uh, the morphogenesis of a division of knowledge uh, over a fairly long period of time with huge amount of data because this is based on all of the meetings that people have face to face and that recorded on uh, potentially on a daily basis you could actually use do a film of this if you were to take it down to the day to day level uh, and so this was then uh, reconfirmed with a, a follow up study not using the face-to-face -face, uh, data, but uh, email data, which um, shows a process, similar process of and using machine reading of the content of the email, uh, and uh, the, showing a similar process of differentiation uh, and emergence from a undifferentiated earlier group of generalists and moving over time to email threads are more and more focused, more and more specialized, what specialists take part in. But there are enough generalists around reading across the different specialty fields for there to be uh, a, a process of specialization that is still leading to a diverse community where people are talking to each other and information is crossing uh, between different uh, network clusters. Uh, so that was really great to see it reconfirmed with a different data set in the same confined uh, geographical space. And so this is a mixed method study. And the big data give you behavioral traces. You, sort of ha you could have a clue of what they talk about because they announced what they talk about in advance, but we didn't use that. But we know they were there, likely there because they RSVP'd. Uh, and this then allows for a dynamic over time study of network morphogenesis. Uh, and then there are observations of natural setting. I've gone to literally hundreds of uh, tech firms, accelerators, small meetups, uh, and watched and talked with people to get a sense of it. And that gives you a more detailed count of knowledge spill, where you see it taking place and you take part in it, and of the network rewiring. Uh, and then face-to-face -face interviews, almost 100 of them, uh, giving fine-grained accounts of pro-social behavior, cooperation, and innovation. And the survey research, there are two waves, 2014, 2018, just completed. And Mike will be pleased to know it <coughs> confirms the idea There's all the variables are correlated. Uh, and so they're wonderful for description, but not so great for testing hypotheses because the the uh, variables are correlated, but you get a confirmation of shared identity and group mindedness from the data because of this clear central tendencies that you find in it. Okay, thank you. Duncan? So you're, you're showing that as a small community grows to a large community, you see uh, 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 um, transition into uh, some uh, additional level of organization where you have sub-communities appearing. Yeah. Um, what would it mean for that not to happen? Like, what would be an example of 
something, you know, in the whether a, in the business world or in the social world or in, in any sort of context where something can grow from a, a few dozen people to fifty thousand people, and for there not to be some sort of differentiation. I mean, is there? You sort of making claims about you know biological morph morphogenesis. Uh, the, is it just like a scaling issue that you know that you, people can only talk to so many others, and so they they kind of have to do the thing that you're describing? Well, the the parallel with biology is just that it's a parallel. I, I think that you see similar dynamics, but they're, they're really different from the social world and the uh, the biological world, but. My guess is that the network rewiring takes place very quickly uh, because of the speed of the emergence. But probably if one were to have gotten data on the early years of Silicon Valley when uh, the dean of the engineering school, Tremaine, uh, gave, uh, I forgot how much money he gave to Hewitt and Packard to start up Hewitt and Packard, that if you were to take a timeline of this emergence process, which is more longer, about 25 years, you would see a similar pattern of uh, network morphogenesis. Uh, because remember, Annalise Saxinian's account of Silicon Valley really emphasizes knowledge spillover and network rewiring uh, taking place outside of the firm. And that is a mechanism that made Silicon Valley more dynamic in its growth than Route 128, where less of that took place. Uh, so, so she didn't have the data for it. She sort of, she, she had the face-to-face -face interviews that suggested something like that was taking place. Uh, and we have the data for this because luckily it begins with the origin and then through the period of the emergence of New York City. Already in 2015, the second largest a knowledge economy in the United States moving slightly ahead of Boston. This year is the best year ever for the New York City tech economy. More money, ca uh, ca uh, venture capital and angel capital came into it and more uh, startups, right? So I, I believe you. I mean, yeah. I, I think you're probably right. Yeah. In Silicon Valley, you would see something similar. Probably if you looked at Boston, you would see something Right, similar. yes. So I guess my question is, when would you not see this? Can, can I take a, a, a Right, right, okay. So I think what Victor, I think it's your your point is well taken that if you assume the sparsification of a network with some kind of Dunbar constraint on degree, uh, as the network gets bigger and sparser, it's, there's going to be these clusters that are going to form. But here's the key question that Victor's paper I think is answering, which is that those clusters could share in common any number of possible node attributes, whether it's physical location or demographic homophily or you name it. But the particular one that they're identifying is knowledge specialization, and that's the. I can right, that's, that's what right. I took to be the really but unique this also part. sounds like any So in other words, the, in, the, the part that could happen anywhere is the clustering, but the part that does not necessarily happen anywhere is that the clusters happen to have in common the specialization of knowledge right, right. as opposed to any of the other possible mm -hmm. node attributes around which they, right. they could have. Uh, just very quick, uh, uh, to, uh, if you imagine the transition from the American uh, sociological society and the founding of the American Sociological Association. And you were to track that over time, uh, the increasing numbers of sections, increasing specialization takes place as the number of sociologists grows, something like that. Uh, yeah, Delia. I want to jump in here because I think that one element that might allow you to nail the Michael's response to Duncan is um, it, it, this is not simply the byproduct of growth but it's, there is some specific mechanism, you might see it in the individual level behavior and you have that. So you might see that essentially the patterns of association, like new people coming in later on are more likely to search out specific meetings right. that are li right. linked to right. that knowledge right. rather than like being undifferentiated in their activities. But this is something that we have not seen here. So we don't know whether the patterns of association uh, have changed over time and might corroborate this idea of uh, sort of like differentiation around topics uh, rather than simply like the, the, the group is growing so essentially they are people have more opportunities <coughs> to just hang out within 
<laughs> right, right. And the new people are even more interested in looking for good mentors. And so they're rewiring very, very quickly uh, as they enter the group. And so one of the uh, questions we asked in 2018 is, who are your most valuable acquaintances? And most of the entrepreneurs are saying the, those they met two to six years ago. In other words, new people they just met at the point of the rising of the uh, tech economy. Yes, uh, Matt. So I think the, the meetup data is really wonderful for providing this like very granular data and over a very long time scale. I'm wondering to what extent you think that really captures what's happening in the entire tech scene in New York. So like you've done also this uh, sort of more ethnographic work and the interview work. And I'm wondering what things do you think are not captured in this big data source and also how the relationship between the data source and the underlying tech scene changes over time. Okay, well, the big data source just simply behavioral traces uh, and, and, and not much more. And to get to the confirmation of the mechanism of knowledge spillover and rewiring, you have to see it take place. And if you see it take place in uh, real time and people doing this uh, and you're obser observing this, that confirms that these mechanisms are doing what they're supposed to do. They're interacting. Uh, and then the, the interviews uh, are retrospective accounts of behavior. Uh, and yet they're these are amazingly p smart people. They all are incredibly articulate, and they are young, and they have good memories, and they prov provide very, very f amazing accounts of just what you're ex explaining taking place through the big data. Uh, very detailed accounts of, say, entrepreneur who started a firm called Proper Cloth that will disrupt how men get custom shirts made, uh, describes in the co-working space uh, just all the help that he received in cooperation from the people who were there, uh, all startup entrepreneurs. And it gives a such detailed account that you know this is rewiring and this is knowledge sharing and spillover. Uh, uh, so that you get the confirmation that you don't get necessarily in the big data. The big data gives you longitudinal account of the emergence and the confirmation of increasingly modular knowledge community over time uh, and that there is a division of knowledge but it's uh, not fragmenting but it's still linked which is what the email analysis shows that there are generalists and specialists and they, they talk to each other. Yes? Uh, I have two questions. Really one, one is um, uh, whether uh, you have some metric that quantifies the degree of differentiation and integration in this kind of network structure. Because I, I want to know, um, yeah, so the, your results are shown visually, but I, I want to know what, what kind of uh, quantitative thing you expect to see you know, when you claim that it, uh, it's a little bit like a bionic. Well, the, 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 again, remember the Durkheim was a functionalist, and I'll be very quick because I've run out of time. And what you see in the uh, linked mo modular knowledge community is something that could fit a functionalist account, that you have the programmers, you have the entrepreneurs who are you have these different specialized community and knowledge, division of knowledge, but they're informing each other and working as a um, collective entity of the tech community where people have shared identity and group mindedness. But I've run out of time, so it's, we have a coffee break now and we can continue discussions. Thank you very much.